Can planting carrots be considered a revolutionary act? Is community gardening a subversive activity? And do African-American community gardeners understand the pan-African roots of what it is that they do? The food justice movement in America is rooted in the production of food. It can be individual, it can be community or collective, it can be corporate, but it doesn't end there. It extends to distribution and trade. It extends to public, and he public safety and health issues. It extends to transportation and community planning and regional development, and I'm not gonna talk about all that tonight. What I wanna talk about is the Near East Side of Columbus. I wanna talk about food justice in the context of a com historic African-American community where we're sitting right now this evening. And I hope that we would understand that in a community that consists of over 14 or 18 different neighborhoods, there's been one consistent element throughout its existence. And that has been the ability to obtain accessible, affordable, nutritious food. We all know, many of us know, the Carl Brown IGA Food Liner. And this was at the corner of Champion, this last uh, edition was at the corner of Champion and Mount Vernon. But Carl Brown started taking food to people's homes with a little trolley wagon. He moved to having piles of produce on a corner before he got this brick and mortar building. He learned the ways of selling food from and to his community by doing it. But he wasn't the first. There was a Mr. Hood. Mr. Hood's grocery was at 178 South High Street near town. These ads are from the Ohio State Journal of March 17 and 18, 1909. We know very little about Mr. Hood, both his personal or professional life. But we do know that he made a tremendous impact on our community because of the documentation of our preeminent cultural historian, the artist Amina Robinson. So she documented Mr. Hood's grocery at the corner of Town and High Street in the early 1900s. But the question for us is, if they were able to do this before, if it was possible to have full service grocery stores, if it was possible to have exchange of produce within the markets, why isn't it possible today? What has happened? That's pro that what are the barriers? Why is it that we aren't able to overcome what needs to be done in the interest of our community? And that's some of what my talk is going to address tonight. In order to do that, I had to look at how did I come to food justice? What was it that attracted me? How did I understand this commitment, not just for myself, but for others as well? And it really began with my family. I'm a third generation member of the Near East Side of Columbus, Ohio. My mother was born and raised at Mount Vernon and 22nd, my father on the Near North Side. My maternal grandfather hunted and fished. He also had an extensive garden, so we were never without fresh produce. My paternal grandparents lived in Cleveland, and they had almost a half acre garden on 76 between Cedar and Central. And my parents, my parents always had a few tomatoes, a few beans, you know, maybe something else over here, but there was always this stubborn patch of mint down in the corner. But also I want to tell you about Aunt Ethel. Aunt Ethel had a farm. It was small, but she had a barn. It was small, but she had cows, and they were thin. <laughs> but we used to pack up and go to Aunt Ethel's as if we were going on an expedition. So we bought things, and we packed them in the truck to take to the country. And then when we got there, the adults talked adult business while the children ran around to see what changes had been made. And at the end of the day, we put country things into the car trunk to take back to the city, and then we got there safely. We were exhausted. But Aunt Ethel's farm was in Blacklick, Ohio. And Blacklick 
is a bedroom community of Columbus right now. And people live in Blackwood and come to work in downtown Columbus every day without a thought. But more about Aunt Ethel later. Because I want to go back to my experiences abroad. And as I lived and worked in various countries of Africa, wherever I lived for even a brief period of time, I had a garden. I also tried to talk with the women whenever I could to learn about different foodstuffs and how to prepare things and what are these seeds and how does this go with this? And they would just say, slow down, Julia Lynn. Slow down. And then we would go to the market and I would say, okay, but I don't understand what this is. And I thought you said, and they would say, yes. So gradually, I learned from the women in my environment, I learned from the women in the market, and I tried to understand how these things all fit together. But eventually, I had to come home. And when I came home, I was very fortunate in being able to obtain a plot owned by the Presbyterian Church that was co-founded by my maternal grandmother and great aunts, and that is now over 100 years old. And this plot was very small at the beginning, but I was very fortunate in having a number of people come forward and to provide assistance. And people came who were neighbors and friends, people came who were members of the church, people came representing different institutions and workplaces and corporate entities, and people came who just wanted to get their hands dirty and fill the soil and see what was growing and what they could do to make a difference. But there was also a very special group, a group of women who worked in the community, who were home health care aides, and who all came from Africa, and who came to me with a handful of seeds and said, could we find some place in your garden to put our food from home? And we did. And not only did we grow the tomatoes that you know, my parents grew, we had the standards, but now we also grew five to seven different types of heirloom tomatoes. We grew a variety of peppers and cucumbers, and we tried to ensure that there was always food available for the community lunch program, for the workers who assisted, and to provide to anyone who came through who said, do you have a few green tomatoes? But there were also young men, some perhaps not so young. But there was one consistent thread for all of these men. They would look at us working in the garden, and they would say, why are you working so hard? What you're doing? That looks like some slavery stuff. I don't understand why you're working so hard. And at first, we want to say, ah, oh, them brothers, and they don't understand. But, but. And then we had to back up and say, wait a minute. We have failed them. We have failed them because we have not provided a paradigm of empowerment that replaces the paradigm of disparagement. We have failed them because we have not been able to share that the enslaved Africans who were brought to the Americas came with knowledge and skills that were essential to the development of the agrarian South that supported the industrialized North. We have failed them because we didn't share that the enslaved Africans who came had over 1,624 years of nation building that included agricultural sustainability that enabled their communities to thrive even in times of civil strife and, and environmental crisis. We have failed because we haven't shared that the fair trade movement that exists today actually has its roots in pre-Civil War activity of free blacks and Quakers who gathered together to ensure that only products produced by free labor were sold in the marketplace. We have failed because by promoting the great man theory of history, we have obscured the contributions of thousands of men and women who contributed to cooperative movements, who, pro who, pr who promoted homesteading, and who ensured that no one, no one was left behind by sharing whatever little they had. 
And we have failed by not acknowledging the strength and contributions of organizations like the Black Panther Party with the free breakfast program and other health initiatives that were demonized and yet adopted by Lyndon B. Johnson under the Great Society program and the War on Poverty. We have failed. But perhaps the biggest indictment of all is that we have failed to promote a model of food justice that is socially transformative as opposed to the current model that relies, relies on handouts, commodity surplus products, and food pantries. We need to do away with food pantries. So what are we going to do? We can't retrace our steps. We can't do the same thing. We think about what happened to the land. And when I think about even what happened to Aunt Ethel's farm, I have to acknowledge that that was also our responsibility. When I asked and said, well, where's the farm? The response was, I don't know. Someone left the farm, there was no caretaker, no one wanted it, we lost it. And even though that was true for some, there was a lot of other land that was stolen from us, either through legal or illegal means, and we have to recognize that that existed as well. But now we're in, back in our neighborhood, and in this neighborhood, we have to recognize that yes, it is a food desert, and that we don't have access to affordable, nutritious food within a one mile radius of our community. It's a food swamp, and that we have too many outlets that provide cal uh, products with empty calories, and that contributed to the health disparities facing our community. And we realize that the response is not just in terms of the, the, the corporations, but what it is that we do ourselves. And so when we look at today, there's a growing increase in the number of African-American farmers. But when you compare 45,000 to 3.2 million in terms of the overall number of farmers, we know that we have a lot more to do. And what we have to do in terms of going back to land is not necessarily look at some of the small farm holdings but look at where we sit today in the urban areas. So the Bronzeville Community Garden, hosted by Bethany Presbyterian Church, gave birth to the Bronzeville Growers Market. And this market has been instrumental in trying to educate people in the community where they are, going to events, going to pop-ups, you know, sharing the food, having tastings, really just sharing whatever we have. We've also made sure that we're a source of community information, so any activities that are available, people have access to. We've provided workshops so people can come and learn about particular topics and gain information that they can go home and work with themselves. We've worked with other markets to ensure that any information we have or any resources we have are shared with those markets. And we've had pick-your-own events where people can come and actually experience, you know, the uh, picking, selecting their own food, and we've also participated with the rescue and recovery efforts led by another nonprofit in ensuring that the food is, is none of it is wasted. But I want to segue now and share with you that this is actually the 50th anniversary of my first trip to Ghana. And that time, I was on the beach, and uh, there were vendors who would come by with cool drink and fruit and whatnot, and this one came, and he had white watermelon. It was the most incredible thing. It was sweet and delicate, and it was a taste sensation that just remained in my mouth. But I never found it after coming back to Ghana years later. And I never found it in the U.S. until recently when I was searching through a catalog and I found the white watermelon. And it was a group of young people who'd searched the world, picking up different seeds to bring back to make sure the diversity of plants were continued. Somebody else had my heritage. Is it a revolutionary act to plant peas? Absolutely. Is it a subversive activity to plant peas? 
to be a part of a community garden. It can be if it's actually a part of a process that challenges the supremacy of notions that really undermine who we are as a people and as a community. Do African-American urban farmers understand their roots of Pan-Africanism? Some are beginning to. We exchange seeds, we have discussions, we look at different practices, and we understand that a lot of what is assumed to be coming from the majority of society actually came from us. So for me now, it's important to think 50 years from now and now white, think about that white watermelon because I don't want the grands and great-grands of my nuclear and extended family to not know the taste of a red strawberry or a green apple. I don't want the grands and great-grands of my nuclear and extended family not to know the feel of putting their hands in soil and the joy of seeing something grow and providing nutrition long after you've planted that seed. And I surely don't want the grands and great-grands of my nuclear family 50 years from now not to have access to affordable, nutritious food in local institutions and local gardens. So I know that in order for this to be true, I have to look at what is it that I can do today. I study. I am mentored. I get my hands dirty. I teach. I lecture. I mentor. I study policy. I share whatever I can. That is what I do today. But this is all of our watch. So for me, there's only one question that remains, and that is, what will you do?